psychiatric evaluation found that he was legally insane at the scene of the crime. He returned to the Bureau of State Prison, where he was wildly successful, becoming a millionaire. A few years ago, he sold the kidnapping story to the movie studio for several times more than the original ransom amount. He showed his papers indicating that all of his profits from the sale would go to charity, and says that he agreed to the new deal only to set the record straight about a lie that he told during the trial back in the 1960s. In fact, then he says he spread a rumor that the kidnapping was only a publicity stunt staged by the Sinatras and not a real kidnapping. Under the Son of Sam law, which says that convicted felons cannot make a profit from selling their own stories, Frank Sinatra Jr. challenged Keeney's contract with the movie studio. In February 2002, the California Supreme Court ruled in Keenan's favor, turning away from the movie that he made. But it never was. The studio, Columbia Pictures, took charge of Ben Bolt. And then in 2003, Showtime made the story into a film, William H. Macy and David Arquette. Barry Keenan, back then in the 1980s. All of me, why not take all of me? Can't you see I'm no good without you? Take my lips, I want to lose them. Act four, the fate most of us fear. Years ago, living in Canada, Jonathan Goldstein had a job selling Montreal Gazette newspapers over the telephone. It's a normal kind of plan B that most of us have at one point or another. And when he took the job, he did not realize that it would become a 10-year chapter in his life. When you're a little kid, you never decide that one day you're going to be a telephone operator. It's not something that you plan. It just happens. Like the way golf balls go together. Or the way falling down a flight of stairs goes together. One minute, you're at the top of the ladder. And the next, you're at the bottom. And you'll be damned if you don't remember each one of the individual steps that led you to where you are today. All during the time I was working in the studio, I made it possible to bring myself to tell everyone I was a television producer. People asked for what they did for a living. I tend to say that I was a tape sorter. And when they asked me what did I sort, I would say dreams. And then I would tell them I was a lawyer and I would sell them. And then I would say I was on the show. And they would say, oh. And I would be very humbled. And they would become uncomfortable. And then they would stop asking me and I would move on. As you might expect, the hard thing about working in the Gazette was that you had so much rejection. Even though you were calling more than 200 people a day, 98% of the people were overseas dead. You still had to bring a certain dolt with you to call. A feeling that this one, the call you were making right now, would be the one. It was almost like trying to hypnotize yourself into believing that something a certain, say, rabbit, did exist. And the next time you drop the apple, it won't fall to the ground, but it will float up into the sky like a helium balloon. I would often pretend the people on the other end of the wire were sock puppets to soften the sting of their hang-ups. I once shared this thought with a girl who had just started working there. Pretend there's a little sock puppet on the other end, I encouraged her, all cute with coat button eyes, holding the phone in his mouth. She considered it a logical one for a moment. How does he toggle the phone in his mouth, she asked. And for this, I really didn't have an answer. In the pitching room, we all wore these headsets that were connected to computers. As soon as we hung up, the computer automatically dialed the next number so that we were always speaking to someone without respite. Our boss was a man named Ray, and if you made two or three sales a day, then you were doing okay, and Ray wouldn't scream at you. Generally, I found the repetitiousness of the job comforting. You're never at a loss for words. You always know what you're going to say. Because what you're going to say is, Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I wanted to know if you're interested in reading the Gazette newspaper. One time, a woman who answered the phone would not believe I wasn't a friend of hers named Christopher. Stop playing around, Christopher, she said. But I'm not Christopher, I responded. Will you cut it out, Christopher? After several minutes of this, I had to hang up on her. I knew that Christopher was going to get it for that. For my very first week at the Gazette, I was surprised.